plugged in, you can hear me. This is the weirdest way of running, of moderating the session all morning in the critical internet resources session. All I could hear was my own voice in complete silence. And despite what Avery thinks, I don't enjoy listening to my own voice all the time. So welcome to the um, workshop, the multi-stakeholder model and evolving GTLD space. In other words, an opportunity to sit around a table and talk about new GTLDs again. Something we're always very happy to do. I'm uh, Chris Spain. I'm a board member of ICANN. I'm also the CCTLD uh, CEO of .AUDA, which is the CCTLD manager for Australia. And I'm also on the multi-stakeholder advisory group. So I am at least partly responsible for putting this whole thing together. We have a, a, a distinguished panel before us today. Uh, starting here on my left is, um, um, is Maria Hall, who's the Deputy Director of the Division for Information Technology Policy of the Ministry of Enterprise, Energy and Communications in Sweden. And to her left is Bill Woodcock, and Bill is the Founder and Research Director at Packet, at Packet Clearinghouse, or PCH. And next to him is Akram Matala, who many of you will know is the Chief Operating Officer of ICANN. And next to, next to him is, prof, is Professor Hong Zhu, hi Hong, Director of Institute for the Internet Policy Law at Beijing University. And finally, this gentleman here is Mohammed Diop, who is the CEO of, how do I say QL? QL.com. And we also are expecting uh, Ambassador Karklins, Janis Karklins from UNESCO, who um, doubtless will join us when he can. So is everybody, everyone can hear me, right? Good. So. Everyone, each one of these panelists has a particular area of, of their involvement in, in the, in the multi-stakeholder process that led to the, uh, the making of new GTLDs. So each one will have a turn, is going to have a turn to speak. But um, I thought we'd start with perhaps Akram giving us a brief update um, on, the, on where we are with the program for the one or possibly two people in the room who don't already know. Akram. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are uh, in the middle of our initial evaluations right now. We uh, are targeting to uh, finish all of initial evaluation for all of the applications by the end of June uh, next year. Uh, in the meantime, there are a lot of other processes that are underway. Uh, we have a, a draw event that will happen in uh, mid-December. Uh, to uh, prioritize all of the applications so that we can uh, sequence them uh, in, uh, in order. Uh, we are also uh, doing right now the clarifying questions. Uh, we were not expecting that uh, we would have a lot of those, but it happens that uh, almost all of the applications uh, will require some clarifications on some issues within the application, so we're formalizing the process. Uh, we are shooting for the question, uh, clarifying questions to come out by the end of this month and hopefully wrap up uh, this uh, part of the process before the end of the year. Um, so th that's uh, something that uh, uh, we had to work on uh, just the last uh, couple of months because we were not expecting uh, that the panels would have so many questions, uh, but that's ongoing. Uh, in the meantime, all of the comments uh, have been uh, gathered. The comment period uh, will, uh, end, uh, will end shortly, uh, and the objections are also uh, ongoing. We aim to start releasing the first part of the IE or the initial evaluations in, uh, toward the end of March. Uh, two weeks before that, I think, is the uh, end of the objection period as well. Uh, so everybody that's making objections will have to uh, finish their objections in, in early March. Uh, then we move to releasing uh, the initial evaluations in, pro, uh, in small batches as they come out in the order of the draw uh, that we're developing right now, uh, that we will be doing in uh, December, actually. So uh, as the uh, applications start coming out, the applicants, if uh, they have no uh, objections or contention, 
will be able to move forward with uh, contracting, uh, which basically means uh, either agreeing to the contract as is or negotiate the contract. If they agree to the contract as is, they can move forward and start doing their, uh, and get an appointment to do their uh, de uh, delegation testing, uh, pre-delegation testing. Once uh, that is done, then toward the, uh, after uh, Beijing, we will start uh, signing contracts and uh, for, for those contracts that are uh, applications that are ready and releasing them into delegation for, IANA, for the IANA process. So that's really in a, uh, a very high level where we are on the program and the future steps that are uh, ahead of us. Thanks, Akram. Um, I'm going to, we're happy to have an interactive discussion, happy for people to ask questions as we go along, uh, and also uh, have a discussion and take questions at the end. But um, you, you want to ask? Sure. Hold on. There are, are the uh, microphones are only down here. Okay. I will, I will be the microphone um, person. Akram. Akram, hi, it's uh, Steve Del Bianco. You can hear me. Good, great. We had a fascinating interchange between governments of the GAC and ICANN in Toronto, and it, it, was, it was not an opportunity to be as open as you can be here. Only if you keep it right here. And the interaction had to do with um, the clarifying questions and representations that an applicant might make in their application. And they might make those representations in responding to your clarifying questions. And I believe it was Chris who was answering some GAC rep questions about whether the representations become part of an enforceable contract for ICANN. And I think Chris was, uh, was saying something about uh, representations are. But as I read so many of these applications, the representations people make are their initial plans or their intentions. It doesn't read to me like a permanent commitment. You seem to be, understand where I'm getting to. And I mean, to keep ICANN completely working in a multi-stakeholder way that is accountable and, and to compliance, It'd be great for us to assure governments of what role we can take to enforce contracts that look to the representations made in an application. Thank you, Steve. So actually, it is true. The contract says that uh, we will uh, only look. Uh, we, uh, the contract is only uh, making sure that the uh, registry will abide by uh, the stability of the registry, making sure that uh, they're behaving according to best practices and uh, technical best practices of the registry. So uh, except for communities, the contract does not enter in, uh, there is no obligations for the registry to uh, fulfill their initial uh, business plan, if you want. Uh, so, so that's something that uh, uh, we are looking into how to mitigate because uh, we received the question from the GAC in the last GAC communicate to the board uh, about uh, objections and agreements that happen all along the way, representations within the application, and uh, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to include these things in the contract. At the same time, we have to figure out uh, how to, you know, enforce or comply, uh, enforce compliance on 1,500 contracts with uh, statements like, I will only accept people before, you know, above the age of 50 and uh, below the age of 70, you know, or, or I, you know, I mean, there are certain things in, in business plans that are very hard to, uh, to comply with or to make, you know, enforce compliance on. So we're looking for, uh, some ideas and we're thinking about that and trying to figure out the best way moving forward on how we're going to make sure that we, everybody complies to what their commitments are, but also we can, uh, we can enforce that compliance. Thanks, Akram. I'm going to take a very quick comment from Stefano and then I'm going to go to, to Maria, um, can you pass that to Stefano, uh, to, Maria, to talk about the government's involvement, since we've started talking about governments anyway, government's involvement, but get Stefano. Very, very shortly about community uh, is a category and uh, uh, the comments from the uh, from the community from from uh, the GAC and uh, also other actors 
uh, that uh, they should like to see uh, that is especially some uh, specific names that are not classified as community should be controlled as they were community. And so this poses a problem where uh, there should be an interaction with uh, uh, this uh, uh, question with, with you because of the, also the contract uh, uh, should change and also the initial proposal in order to uh, satisfy the request of uh, certain names to be treated as community. This is not an easy uh, thing uh, for, for, for us, uh, at least. Uh, <laughs> opinion of a GAC member. Thank you, Stefano. Do you want to just respond? Or? Okay. Uh, yes, we understand that, and uh, it's not an easy problem to solve to begin with, but we, uh, we are looking at ways to, um, if there is an objection to an application, as one of the remedies is to actually make it a uh, community and list the things that they will have to comply with uh, so that they fall into the category where we can enforce that and, and the compliance process. And, and we're looking at ways, other ways to also uh, uh, make sure that any agreement or commitment that they make in order to uh, come out of an objection uh, process or to uh, satisfy some of the comments that have been uh, put against the, TL, uh, the TLD or the application can be enforced. Thanks, Akram. So having started with an update, I kind of kind of knew we'd end up going into some, some questions about the, the process, but if we, if we can come out of that now and, and come back to what this workshop's actually supposed to be about, which is using the new GTLDs as an example of the multi-stakeholder model uh, in the evolving GTLD space. And I'd like to ask Maria uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the role of governments in that process, both uh, from the past and going forwards, uh, from policy development through to implementation. Thanks, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. This is weird, actually. Is weird? <laughs> this is weird, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> should get used to it uh, by now. Anyway, I find myself here sitting and talking about new GTLD, as I didn't get enough uh, in Toronto for a few weeks ago. <laughs> but nevertheless, here, here we go again. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> anyway, I just want to make a few uh, general comments to start with, uh, and, and of course, as you as you all understand, and especially I can, I hopefully uh, understand that by now that Sweden strongly supports the ICANN model. I think that's that's very, very important to, to put forward. Uh, I try to do that uh, as often as I can. But of course, yes, there are room for improvements. And yes, improvements actually needs to be done. And I and I think it, the best way actually to, to, now we are here at the IGF meeting and we have a lot of discussions about other meetings coming up in Dubai, for example, and so on. So I think the best, actually, the best tool for for keeping or protecting or, or preserving this model is actually make those improvement. Uh, that's a matter of accountability and transparency and uh, all these kind of other things. And of course, as you see as well, actually, we have more and more governments are interested in this, uh, actually. It's just we, have, we have right now in the Governmental Advisory Committee 120 uh, governments, and we have, I think, around 25 observers. So there are more, more discussions about this and more voices are, are being heard. And of course, with all these new voices uh, being heard, of course, th th it leads to also to more demands on the organization, which is also important to understand. Uh, but, uh, and then I, I can move on to the new DTLB program, because as I said before, th there are improvements that need to be done. There are actually a few holes in the processes still that we from 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 uh, from Sweden and also from from the government think we need to be put in place as, as quick as possible and uh, but to go a little bit back in time we I mean in, in Sweden and as well as other other countries in the GAC have been very very much involved in this process and there have been several of these uh, draft applicant guidebooks uh, on the table and that was actually long before I started to to, to do this things with my, my colleagues in Sweden doing that before. So, I, but I think it was in the, in, the, in the end, actually, one and a half year ago, when we were working hard, uh, the governments with a scorecard, I think that was a very, very, well, it was a good work from, from our side. It was very efficient and we came into conclusion of few, actually 12 different outstanding issues that we put in, put in on paper. And uh, many of them, of course, have, have a strong public policy uh, 
aspects. I mean, consumer rights, they got common economy, economic uh, perspectives, or technical infrastructure perspectives, and so on. So, uh, of course, uh, but we are only only on the start now, and and, and this is this is uh, this is a process that's going to go on for for quite a while, I understand. And there there needs to be a, a bunch of things done with this, and and we are looking forward to hear more and more from 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 ICANN's side to see how you how you um, do the improvements, how you move forward, and, and what is going to happen. And of course, what is what is important that I try to put forward. Every every time I can, actually, what effects will this lead to this new program? And I'm, of course, I'm talking about, uh, as I always do, about the the um, effects on on the internet infrastructure. But there are also administrative administrative process effects that could be that is very interesting to follow. They the probably going to be a bunch of business oriented uh, effects. It's going to be consumer effects and so on. So I think it's it's very very important that. We have to do a, a deep evaluation, so we see all these effects. What what did it lead to, and then actually make sure we have tools to 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 adjust where things need to be adjusted. And um, in, in general, this also means because th there are so many public policy issues in, in all these questions. So it means that actually, I can needs to get. A little bit better understanding how government works to, to to put this earlier, to bring us in earlier in the processes and so on. So that is something I know that we have been talking about, uh, and I must must say, from my my personal point of view, being in this system now for a few years, I think I think the dialogue between between the governments and the ICANN board is 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 it, it's become much much better. It's very much appreciated, I think. But but of course it's not only uh, ICANN that needs to understand how how governments work. Actually, governments also need to understand how ICANN works. So it's like a mutual understanding. And then I would like to say what uh, I very much appreciate you, Fadi, for saying that in Toronto that we are a part of a multi-equal, uh, multi-stake, multi-equal state. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Sorry. So by saying this multi-equal stakeholder uh, environment also means that we, we, we are, all of us make to, uh, are a part of a decision and, and all voices have to be heard. So that is something that we're looking forward to have a continuous dialogue with you. Thank you. Maria, thanks. I, you, you raise an interesting, you talk, an interesting point. You talk about ICANN needs to learn better how to work with, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So you said that ICANN needs to learn better how to work with governments, but also governments need to learn better how to work with ICANN. And the new, G, the new GTLD program's done a, a whole number of things, and one of the things that it's done is to lift the profile of the GAC and give the GAC a much higher profile. Um, how much of a challenge is it for governments to learn how to operate in a, in a multi-stakeholder model, equal multi-stakeholder model? How much of a challenge is that? Well, I, I think it's it's it has been a challenge before. Uh, it's, it still is a challenge. It, it's also it's always a challenge, not only for governments, by the way. It's a challenge for everybody to come to the table together and understand how the other stakeholders working and and it is because we are in 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 the middle of different processes and we are kind of based on, on different uh, well, rules and and, uh, and so on. So so it's 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 not hard only for governments. It's hard for for everybody. But I also think that a lot of things has happened during the years. I mean, IGF, that this IGF process and the dialogue we have with every stakeholder here is, has been very valuable. I mean, also it, it's made a big influence on how we work also domestic. Thank you. We're going to move on in a minute and talk about uh, some, uh, I sort of talk to Yanis about some IDNs and Hong about IDNs in Asia. But before we do, does anybody want to ask a question or raise a point about the government's role uh, in this, the multi, in the multi-stakeholder model, and how uh, how complicated or difficult that might be. Seeing no one. Excellent. Okay. So, <laughs> so Yanis, um, could you uh, look um, talk about the internet, the multilingualism contributing to development, and uh, how you, how UNESCO perceives the potential impact of IDN CCTLDs on the on the internet. So thank, thank you, Chris, for, for uh, 
asking this question. Um, I think that there are a couple of um, uh, points which uh, I would like uh, to talk about. Uh, first, first of all, is um, why why we are doing this, and uh, uh, w whether there is a demand uh, on IDN uh, uh, TLDs. In that sense, uh, I think we are we're just starting to understand. We have a perception uh, that um, IDNs would uh, considerably increase the um, number of people who could uh, access internet and could use internet. Uh, which could not be done now uh, because of the language barrier. Uh, we uh, Last year we started together with URID uh, an analysis of uh, IDN uptake in uh, CC area. And uh, uh, what this analysis uh, show that um, for the moment we are facing uh, certain challenges uh, in uh, IDN uptake, which are uh, which have two uh, main sort of reasons. One is technical reason, and another is uh, organizational reason. Uh, the technical reason is that services which are available on IDN uh, uh, TLDs uh, do not um, are not at the same level as ASCII uh, TLDs, and some uh, further work is needed to. Uh, make browsers support IDNs uh, to introduce uh, uh, IDN email c uh, capability uh, to um, introduce um, services on major social, starting with major social um, uh, sites uh, which are not today supporting any IDNs. So these um, uh, elements were identified as obstacles for the moment on ID IDN uptake. Another uh, part was linked with the organizational um, uh, character and uh, the policies which exist in different countries uh, in, uh, in terms of registration of IDN uh, uh, domains. Uh, and we, we have proved that where policy uh, of registration is liberal, the uptake is, is uh, faster and, and where policies are more restrictive, uh, uptake is, is not so fast. And, um, and the final point, uh, we also identified that for the, for the moment we need to stimulate uh, the uh, demand because uh, we have created offer uh, by introducing IDN CCTLD fast track uh, policy and allowing uh, the, uh, I mean, and introducing in the root IDN CCTLDs. We have created offer, but we need to stimulate uh, demand. Uh, so that, that is on, on, on technical side. Uh, on more cultural side, uh, certainly, we uh, we think that IDNs will play an important role, and we already see that um, the content uh, which is uh, created in different languages uh, is growing uh, uh, fast. And uh, I think that very soon, uh, content in English will not uh, be any more the first. Uh, the, 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 the biggest volume on, on, on the net. So uh, other, other content on the, in other languages is, uh, is, is, is catching up uh, very quickly and that, that is linked also with the, with the growth of uh, uh, internet users outside English-speaking countries. Um, uh, that, that said, uh, we are actually with the IDN policies and stimulating IDN introduction, we are actually not targeting that uh, audience uh, which are currently using internet. But those who are not using internet simply because they do not uh, understand ASCII or Latin script. And most probably all of us here in this room think that every person on the planet uh, understands or, or recognizes uh, Latin script. I, I believe this is not, not true. So, and we're, by introducing IDNs, we're giving opportunity uh, to use internet those uh, people who do not master uh, Latin script at all. So that, that is uh, uh, the important stimulus behind the uh, IDN, IDN program. So I will maybe stop here and would be happy to answer questions. So you talked about in, in our current experience with CCTLD IDNs and services not, not being at the same level as they are for ASCII. 
and content obviously not being at the same level as it is for ASCII. Do, do you think that having more IDNs, GTLD IDNs, is going to encourage an increase in the, in the content and the service because they're more commercial proposition perhaps than the CCTLD ones were? Or just generally? I think that that might be the case. Uh, but again, uh, we, we need to uh, resolve a couple of, or we need to increase of um, uh, offer on services uh, which, which are supported or which support IDNs. Uh, without that, I, I believe that the uptake will have similar trends as uh, with the uh, IDN CCTLDs, uh, where uh, after this um, euphoric period will come serious uh, uh, drop in, in number of uh, registered domains simply because of uh, insufficiency of services. Introduction of new GTLDs may put additional uh, pressure in, in a positive sense to technical community to work on a resolution of those uh, technical issues which are now which are not now resolved which are not resolved now um, because uh, these um, uh, these issues will move from CC space to G space and that is where uh, where a lot of activities or majority of activities are taking place at least for the moment does anybody want to pick up on the IDN question? Jan, are you? Yeah, I'll come down. It's a great exercise. Thank you, Chris. Since uh, Chris is looking at me, so I have to say something, seems like. <laughs> Actually, uh, we do have this uh, uh, joint IDN uh, working group from CCISO and the GSO in ICANN. Well, we did have discussion on one topic, one three top topics we've been discussed is um, uh, universal acceptance uh, of IDN. Uh, I, I do believe uh, I can also have a project going on, universal acceptance. So we've been discussing you know, what kind of role I can could play in this uh, uh, to promote uh, on the uh, sub uh, support uh, for the browser support is uh, basically it's not uh, so it's, it's a complicated issue it's not only browser is also ISP uh, is also on application support you know so we've been discussing on that and uh, I think we're making progress on that uh, probably I can should be aware of this issue too you know uh, to see what kind of role I can could play uh, in, in this uh, uh, issue for the uh, universal acceptance Thanks, Jan. So we're going to stay with ID. Sebastian? Sure. Thank you, Chris. Yanis, you talk about the fact that there is a link between uh, the new CCTLD IDN and the content in the, the same language. Have you? Um, figures for that and um, how you were able to measure that and do you think that it will be the same trend uh, for the G space? Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, there, there is no, um, let's say, organized uh, collection of statistics on, on, on these issues uh, by working on the world report on ID and uptake. Uh, URID is starting to um, uh, create the series of data uh, related to uh, IDN num uh, number of uh, IDN registrations, trends, and so on. Uh, last year, uh, OECD, um, uh, together with UNESCO and ISOC, uh, did a study on uh, the economic aspects of local content creation where we are looking at um, the correlation between the volume of local content which is kept on local internet infrastructure and the access price. There also we uh, were confronted with the uh, situation that there is not sufficient data and if we can get data, uh, do a snapshot in, in a situation in one country, then we do not have a, a series of data on the same subject in the same country. So the da data collection is an, uh, is an issue. 
Uh, but going forward, we hope that we will get uh, more understanding what data needs to be collected, and um, uh, we will we will do that uh, on yearly basis. At least this is our intention. Thanks, Yanis. Hong, I'm going to turn to you now. Ne nearly half of the internet internet population coming out of, comes out of Asia. What do you think is the what's the potential for new DTLDs, including IDN DTLDs, on for end users in 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 in, in Asia? Thank you, Chris. Uh, I guess uh, uh, for the topic assigned to me, I can see two themes. One is on IDN, another is on Asia Pacific. For IDNs, I talk a lot in the morning session. Um, to summarize what I talk about in the morning, I mean that the knowledge of IDN language community should really be accommodated and respect all through the new GTLD process because this IDN new GTLD is to address the user's need, user's demand, and have to respect the user's experience. For example, how to assess the confusing similarity and should be decided by the people who really use that IDN scripts, of course, without prejudice to the stability and security of the DNS uh, system. Well, I, I will be brave. Please refer to my morning presentation on IDN. But for Asia Pacific, I do have a pretty long one. Uh, uh, okay, I, I want to talk from a new perspective. It's never been talked about at ICANN, actually. I want to talk about the regional integration in Asia Pacific and the multi-stakeholder participation at ICANN. Well, in Asia Pacific, I, I wouldn't repeat what has been talked about many times, the diversity, how many countries, how many languages, uh, uh, how complicated the region is. What I want to say is that actually this region is quickly integrated economically. When the world economy is gloomy, uh, the Asia Pacific is still developing very reasonably. We can see some sub-regional groups such as ASEAN, and South Asia, Central Asian groups. Uh, th these sub-regional groups have been existing for a long time. What we can see is that the whole region is Asia Pacific is also integrating not only economically, but also they're making uh, the, the, the regional rules, agreements, legal system. This is the soft infrastructure for all the new GTLD to operate. I guess this is something should be taken into account. ICANN will delegate a couple of new GTLDs and uh, there's uh, more than 300 applicants from Asia Pacific. Of course, ICANN is not, does not have the simple task to delegate. They wish the new GTLD to operate in this region. And we need to think about these uh, soft infrastructure, the, the, the legal social norms operating in this region. Uh, I have a few examples. For example, what is happening right now, the negotiation, this very famous Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Um, this is a very important trade agreement and there's a very long chapter on intellectual property protection. What is very interesting, there's a specific provision on CCTLD and the trademark protection. So it seems it's pretty clear in the future, the enforcement through uh, the domain name system, either through the CCTLD or currently through the GTLD will be a normal um, uh, uh, mechanism for intellectual property enforcement. Um, another example is that United Nations uh, Economic and Society Committee for uh, Asia Pacific, U UNSCAP, is now drafting a regional agreement on paperless trade, um, it, is, it is now under membership consultation. This will uh, tremendously impact the data flow, especially the data ESCO and the retention. So these regional agreements, legal system are really developing. Uh, we know EU is pretty active at ICANN and also at GAC and you have some uh, regional uh, agreements, legal system, and there's been a will to ICANN, and especially for ICANN law enforcement consultation has been very active. Do you have the, the similar mechanism to Asia Pacific, these IGOs, UNSC? Uh, the ICANN engagement, global engagement program could outreach to these uh, very much important stakeholders. Uh, to go to the uh, users and the business, uh, finally, <laughs> 
Oh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, seems to be pretty quiet in the new GTLD policy making process. Use an example of trademark protection. Um, I just talked with the uh, with the single developing countries uh, representative in the. Um, a new GTLD uh, trademark protection working group. It seems that these current trademark protection model um, is will be effective, uh, hopefully, uh, for the developed economy. But it will be hard for the small startup enterprise in Asia using local brands in local scripts. Uh, that's simply too costly for them to use the trademark clearinghouse, the famous URS and even the UDRP. So these are all the things we should think about for the future engagement and for the equal multi-stakeholder model to develop in the whole Asia. Thank you. Hong, can I ask you to uh, just think, Konak, the, the China has, uh, through Konak, has applied for a number of, of Chinese, of RDN, uh, GTLDs, um, uh, dot, dot commercial, I think, and uh, I mean, what, that may not be the right word. But do, can you address Yanis's point? Do you think that that these, with enough push from the from the a G, what is effectively a GTLD registry, Konak, that those can become vibrant uh, GTLD spaces with uh, with you know, it, with content and, and and so on? Thank you, Chris. This is exactly something I, I want to talk about, and hopefully it is not controversial. Um, I must say, um, Chinese government has already released a national domain name system. Uh, it's in a, um, a public announcement. In that announcement, we can see uh, those uh, new GTLD applications have already been written into the system. Uh, dot company, uh, dot network, uh, dot public affairs, and dot governmental affairs. They've been written into the system already, and it's been announced to the whole country. Now, it's an interesting issue. This is not the answer. It's a question to ICANN. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> in your review and assessment, we will consider about these uh, uh, national uh, decision. Oh, this is very interesting. Okay, go to your question. Uh, I have to say that uh, these, uh, uh, you talk about the CONAX two applications, they're being operating, yes. One is for dot governmental affairs, one, another is dot public interest, all in Chinese scripts. They're operating in China already, and they're making money, working very well. And <laughs> this is a quasi-governmental agency, so they're actually selling, uh, providing the domain names through the official channels. They were living very well, yes. So there is scope, Yanis, for the... Uh for, for the takeoff of IDNs, Mohammed, um, Africa. What what about what about Africa? Business opportunities there, and and uh, op what opportunities can new GTLD bring? G GTLDs bring to the continent. Um, okay, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think that if you want to understand um, what are the challenges for the African continent, I really need to come back on the core value that we're sharing and that. We have tried to um, come regarding the consumer choice, regarding competition, and this is really uh, what we're trying to, to achieve uh, through the program. The consumer trust is another, uh, is another area where I need to, to talk a little bit more. But in fact, um, if you look at the numbers in terms of uh, CCTLD and GTLD, you know that in the new application program, they have 17 uh, applications from Africa. Well, it just give you an example that there are some uh, people in the continent who try to uh, participate. But how we achieve the goal of getting some of the application being present? You remember that the JAS program that I can have trying to achieve is based on the um, assessment that uh, the cost of the GTLD program was a little bit high for developing country, and they try to find mechanism in which they can um, facilitate uh, the new DTLD applicants from the developing world. So this also reached um, one of the model why ICANN was trying to understand that uh, the the world in which we're living, people do not have the same revenue, do not have the same money, and we need really to see how to accommodate with third world countries and how we can have some specific program that match with the uh, African continent. But if you look at in the past, how many GTLD you got in the continent, it was none. If you look at also um, how many registrars we got in the continent, 
it was none until 2006. This means what? It means it doesn't mean that we don't have domain names. We have. It doesn't mean that we did not register domain names. We register. Uh, CCTLDs have a very diverse um, operation status. Some of them are performing well, some others not well. And if you look at the whole um, internet community as a whole, it becomes one of our main duty as the uh, organization who try to deliver the services to the end user to be sure that the service that operators are delivering to the customer are the first choice services. It means it becomes a debate on uh, from when or up to when I can can go in terms of facilitating, in terms of giving um, technical assistance, in terms of uh, helping operations on field to move. But uh, this is another discussion that I don't want to keep it in the CCTLD, but I want just people to understand what's happening uh, from existing operation because this is what we got on field. And when it comes to GTLD uh, in African continent, I want to raise a point that is very important and we're working but not working hard to make it happen, is the consumer trust component in the African continent. Why it is important to understand the mechanism? If I told you that until 2006 there was no registrar in the African market, what does it mean? Who operate on the local market when you want to register .com, .org, .net, whatever you imagine? It means it's a second level, third level, or fourth level of people who have no contractual agreement with ICANN, who have no duties to perform. I mean, these, these are just people who intervene in the market. And when it comes to legal implication, when, it, when a problem happens and when a problem occurs, that's really where you understand why the lack of proper interface in the African continent is one of the major barriers of the penetration of domain names. But um, I want just to relativize a little bit this because some people say, why we cannot move for resellers? I say, no. I mean, we want to have proper interface. I can have to populate more and more. It's, people are going to say, well, it's a private thing, so we don't need to, we don't know how to make it. It's to African people to make it happen. If you go to the African strategy for ICANN, where they put direction on how this institution in a multi-equal stakeholder approach can better serve developing country and African continent, it is our duty to help get a proper and better industry serving end users in our continent. And we cannot achieve it if we're just looking at the market and let people play in games. Because people who are selling domain names in African continent are not people who's, who are buying it by legal agreement or with contractual with ICANN. And these put our end users and registrants at a very high level exposure that at the end, what is the decision? We prefer to live without any problem. And this explains a little bit the level of penetration of domain name that is very slow. I mean, if I give you numbers, you will just 1% of .org in Africa. Uh, if you look at .com or others, I mean, we have less than 2 million domain names in the whole African continent for 1 billion, uh, I mean, users. It's, I mean, are we going to be just satisfied with the numbers and saying that, well, what can we do or just uh, is that, do we challenge ourselves or do we think to have another uh, lecture of what domain name penetration mean to us? Because I think that when within the ICANN community, when we look at numbers regarding domain names, some people are very happy with the uh, 250 million domain names worldwide. I'm not happy with it. Uh, if I look at the mobile penetration, 6 billion. If I look at the IP penetration, billions of billions on domain name running in the network. So when it comes to domain name, we talk about 2 million, 2, 250 million domain names, and we're happy with it. What does it mean? It means if nothing is done, people will shift from this system that we already have elaborated for over a couple of years, trying to build something very serious, coherent, and uh, to allow people to expand very easily, to a system where the expansion will happen somewhere else. And this somewhere else, nobody can predict now what it's going to be. But in Africa, the mobile penetration is very high. Domain name is just at that level, very few for GTLD and even for CCTLDs. But for us, the only message we kept from the GTLD program is two things. First is ICANN is willing to open up and let the community drive their program by showing that they own a community and they want to have their own TLD. The second one is African people have started submitting their application. It means it's a boulevard for them.
to, for community who are ready to join, to be able to join. And this is a very important thing in the core value of that multi equal shareholders. It means give consumer the choice and also protect the customer to be able to express themselves as a whole community. IDN was a big achievement, and I think that there is room for improvement, but I think that it was a great achievement from that community. So it's, so it's, not, it's not just price. So, so looking forward to a possible round two, what I, what I think you're saying is it's not just price, although the price needs to come down. It's also getting established industry in Africa around existing existing GTLDs, existing CCTLDs domains, so that there's a market for the entrepreneurs in Africa to go out and, and apply for new GTLDs. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, saying that application will not only, I mean, the main focus, because the market have to address, you know, product and supply chain and how you, do, uh, how you distribute the product in the system. What I'm saying is if, only, if people only focus on GTLD program, and that was one of the weaknesses of the JAS program is they just think about facilitating the um, reducing the price of the submission will be enough to have more and more application uh, driving from Africa. But no, I mean, this is not the more challenging side of the project. If you get your TLD up and running, and if you want to have this available to the end users, and you don't have any proper channel where people have responsibility, and where people can face with law enforcement mechanism, where people have to respect local jurisdiction, I mean, how are we going to, uh, I mean, give satisfaction to end users? This is really a big challenge. And I think that it's not only something that I can have to look at as something outside of its scope, but I think that it has to be a greater responsibility from ICANN to see how they can support local operations to, uh, to make these things performing well. Okay. Average... Avery, you were shaking your head. Did you want to say something? <laughs> you sure? Anybody else want to comment? Can you hear me? Does anybody else want to comment on what we've heard so far before we move on to the exciting topic of security and stability? We're going to be finished early. Fantastic. Um, Bill, new GTLDs, security and stability. Okay, so um, the really easy question that uh, people have been thrashing back and forth for the last year or so and uh, failing to really, what? Well, no, Chris tells me they've come to agreement on is that there will be a thousand new TLDs in the root zone before the RSSAC folk, RSSAC folks need to come up with a new number. Um, uh, you know, that's a few root server operators in a closed room coming out with a random integer. Uh, I just cut the checks and reboot the things, so what do I know? Uh, the CapEx and OpEx and operational security and operational procedures wouldn't really change up through a few tens of millions. Uh, so it's really not very interesting one way or the other. Um, on the other hand, uh, the big thing that ICANN does with respect to the security of the root is they maintain the trust relationships with the root, sorry, with the TLD operators. Right now, that's 300 TLD operators that have to be known to ICANN staff and trusted, and when they have. Uh, staff turnover on the TLD operator side, the ICANN staff have to know who the new people are and whether or not they're also trusted. Um, that is a very human process and obviously one that doesn't scale into the tens of millions uh, with any reasonable uh, investment. So I would say that's a much bigger issue than how many zones you can cram into a root server. Um, which is not the limiting factor here. Um, other interesting things, there's the sort of mandatory DNSSEC requirement on the new GTLDs. Uh, excellent thing. It'll be great to have some drive behind getting Dane finished up and more widely deployed and getting Dane supporting or Dane extended to support things like uh, SMTP for email and IMAP for going and getting your email and Jabber for chat and uh, 
SIP so that you can use it for authenticating a phone call. Um, I think having DNSSEC on all of these new domains is going to further drive that the creation of a market around uh, authenticated services based on DNSSEC. So I think that's a good thing. Um, the problem is that DNSSEC implementation is still difficult. Uh, very smart people with lots of resources behind them are still occasionally making uh, fatal errors that require messy uh, explanations and cleanup and so forth. Um, so I think a lot of the folks who are now being mandated to do DNSSEC who checked the little box and said, yes, sure, I'll do that if that's what I have to check the box for to get the domain, uh, are going to be confronted with the reality of actually implementing that and the uh, you know several person years of work needed to get it to the point where it may function. Um, a lot of that they're going to wind up outsourcing. If they outsource, then obviously the trust relationships will be of somewhat lesser value. Um, uh, last area that I think I should probably try and hit is uh, something that hasn't really been considered a lot in the domain name community, I think, yet. But um, the practice that domain name name server operators use right now is to anycast their name servers. Uh, and that requires, well, even if you didn't anycast them, um, you need a block of IP addresses for each name server that is big enough to be accepted in the global routing table. Um, presently, it's difficult to get ISPs to accept a block of less than 256 addresses. At the same time, uh, best practice says that you need two or three, at a minimum, name servers. That means that you need, let's say, two IP addresses, but you have to get 512 of them and waste 510 of them. Um, this doesn't sit very well with the Regional Internet Registry community, the RIRs, who have to give out those addresses and are <coughs> presently more or less out of them. Um, so there are a couple ways this could go. Uh, one way is to convince the ISP community to start accepting smaller blocks of IP addresses. This will probably happen, but it's a very long, slow process, it's something that has been happening for the last 15 years or so, and I don't see that there's going to be any radical acceleration in the rate at which it happens. Uh, so we're shortly going to have a few hundred new GTLD operators who are going to run into a wall, and they are not presently considering its existence. Um, there was a proposal at the Aaron meeting two weeks ago that will probably be of some interest to people in this community, which was to allow new GTLD applicants to apply for address space, sorry, to apply for needs-based uh, authorization to receive address space based solely upon showing that they had submitted and had ex uh, received by ICANN a, uh, an application for a new GTLD. So they would not have to show current use, they would not have to show that they had already deployed infrastructure, etc. Uh, however, the proposal came with the limitation that they could not receive address space from the free pool, nor from the critical infrastructure pool, and that they could only use this demonstrated need uh, on the transfer market. Um, so from the RIR perspective, this is kind of killing two birds with one stone. It is uh, creating demand in the transfer market at the same time as it's telling a bunch of new GTLD applicants to get off of our lawn. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, you guys might have an interest in... Uh, showing up at an RIR meeting and uh, expressing your opinions about that. I don't know. Any? Steve? Strangely.
Dr. Crocker. Hi there. Um, is this on? Yep. Yeah, good. Uh, so uh, it's, it uh, taxes my memory at this hour to remember three things at once uh, that you put forth. But if I recall in reverse order, uh, the address space issue, um, the DNSSEC impact, and the trust relationship on the update of the things. So on the, on the last, you're for more familiar with the addressing policies than I am. I had been under the impression that top TLD uh, name servers were treated specially um, and that there is a provision there. There is, of course, also the opportunity uh, or the option of any TLD operator to make use of name services uh, provided by various operators, I think including even yours. Um, and so uh, the other thing is that for the benefit of, of, of the of, of probably almost everybody in this room except you and me, there, there was one little piece of what you said that probably bears a bit of expansion. Um, a name server gets a single address. The, uh, the, your, your reference to needing a block of addresses has to do, I believe, with uh, having nothing else in that block except that name server as a way of protecting that service uh, so that there's no shared fate with Correct. other things there. So that's a, um, a more subtle operational choice. You could, if you chose to, put other things in that space. Or you could choose to make the block a single address and try and get uh, network operators to accept that single address as That was what you route. suggested about yes. the routing, uh, yep. but, but just, just to flesh that out for, uh, for the group here. Um, uh, I would say uh, if, if somebody came to me and said, I want to uh, put forth a new uh, TLD and I want it to be uh, well served, I would say, well, of the several parts of your problem, the, the business of getting name servers uh, uh, populated with your zone, um, you can, of course, put your own set of name servers in place, but um, there's no necessity of that. You could easily outsource or share that with others or uh, do many other things. So that, that is, a, I would say, a manageable process. Um, if you look at the question of new market entrants and whether they are being treated equitably, I think it's reasonably likely that at least in the U.S. you would find litigious folks who would say that. I, I, I'm, I'm not hearing everything, but I, what, what, I, what I'm thinking is there's, we did, we did um, uh, a session um, on DNSSEC enabled uh, name server operators, which you were there, um, where was this? Um, Singapore, I think. And there were, I forget the precise number, five, six, seven uh, distinct operators, uh, all of whom were uh, offering to provide name service for at rates that I would guess would be competitive with trying to set one up yourself, never mind the cost of the address space, which is. Um, separate from the cost of actually mounting servers and putting them in, in colos and so forth. So um, the net of all this is, uh, yeah, there's some things to look at there that I would suggest that's probably not the biggest issue uh, for name server operators. The not DNSSEC, the as, you, as you know and as you, you spoke quite eloquently, at, um, the experience curve is going up rapidly. Um, there are glitches which uh, are part of the early learning experience. There's also the experience base and expertise and tool sets and all of that. Uh, so again, um, this is one of these things where you can make, make it seem large or you can make it seem small and the experience will be um, a little bit wherever it happens to wind up for your experience. The, the issue of the uh, trust relationship is a uh, is an interesting one, and uh, it's really, I think, for the IANA folks to speak clearly about all this, and I don't want to um, speak authoritatively for them, but, but I think there is something that is relatively well known, which is there's been a lot of energy in building automated interface to greatly reduce the workload and to greatly increase the um, uh, reliability and security of the interactions. 
Uh, I don't know what the precise policy is. I don't know if they require the use of that interface for all new GTLDs. Uh, Akram, is that, a, is that a requirement? Yes, all of the new GTLDs will go through the RZM. So, sorry. I, I guess you're talking about the RZM, and uh, all of the new GTLDs will go through that. All right. So, so there's a qualitatively uh, uh, improved uh, interface, which has, um, I, I, and I think in simple terms, the automation reduces the workload and. Uh, there is a, a much tighter uh, relationship. Um, I would say it's probably a reasonable question to see if there's some way of uh, measuring or monitoring those interactions over time to see if there are any uh, glitches or near glitches or uh, issues that come up. And, um, but they've been using it for a while, so I'm sure there's some experience base already there. Um, so I don't know if that's a, a sufficient set of um, uh, rebuttal is too strong, but comments that, that add a little color to the points that you've raised. I think um, the issue with the address space is not so much one of feasibility. There are plenty of ways around this. There are plenty of ways that people can get their needs met to some degree. It's really a question of whether new market entrants will be supported in the same way that TLD operators have been up until this day. And almost without question, the answer is going to be no. And that means that there are going to be lawsuits. Well, I guess, I guess I'm surprised that you would say that. Um, there is a vibrant market, which you're part of, uh, to supply name service to that class of customers. Right. So and, and you already have the namespace you need because you can reuse the same name server addresses for multiple TLDs. Only at the cost of the shared fate that you mentioned, right? And so currently TLD operators do not view that as a best practice to share fate between multiple domains within the same BGP advertised block. Okay? So we can abandon that, but the people who are currently operating TLDs are not going to want to abandon that. And that means only the new people are going to have to operate within this less than best practice environment. Right? So we can, we can do that. That's one compromise. Um, the other compromise is abandoning them to the transfer market, in which case they say, well, everybody before us got this for free, and we have to pay these exorbitant prices. They're used to that. Yeah, right. So that's another compromise. It's just that there, there are a bunch of different possible compromises. None of them give the people who are starting now the same advantages that people who have brought up TLDs up until this point have had. Thanks, Bill. I'm going to throw to Akram before I do. One second, Akram. Uh, when Akram's finished speaking, I'm going to take questions on anything anybody wants to ask questions about. I mean, within the context of what we're talking about, meaning of life questions will not be accepted. Akram, go. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bill, are you talking about IPv4 or IPv6? V4 specifically. V6 is not a problem. Okay. Well, <laughs> IP, we're, we're, uh, we are actually expecting everybody to move to IPv6. So I was uh, hoping that this would not be an issue. Yeah, but that's a 20-year process. We're already 20 years in. There'll be another 20 before we're done. Okay, we're going we're gonna to close down that discussion right now because um, we could talk about IPv4, IPv6 forever and probably will. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is um, Liz Sweezy. I have a question for Hong. You mentioned um, some, uh, that the Chinese and, um, and other countries in the Asian region have been um, relatively quiet on the trademark front, and I was hoping that you could elaborate on that. Oh, thank you uh, for the intervention uh, very much. Uh, oh, well, this is information I just acquired this morning uh, from my friend who is working on uh, GNSO. Uh, he's been involved in the uh, trademark uh, protection uh, measures uh, from day one. Um, well, what is mentioned that he's the only one from the developing economies 
and the same to you voiced uh, many times in the working group that these uh, uh, very much centralized costly trademark measures uh, may not be workable, uh, especially for this uh, small enterprises in Asia Pacific. But he's uh, very much uh, he was very much alone, so that was not built into the policy. Uh, that's what I heard. Uh, of course, this is only uh, one source of information. Uh, I can give you my personal assessment. Uh, currently, the, the, the trademark clearinghouse is, is, is really a centralized system. It's based in Europe, and uh, it seems it's charging very much high fees. So think about those small local brands. Are they really willing to use that services? And for this uh, uh, uniform rapid suspension system, uh, while well, the policy is still being revised, um, it seems you need a, really a law department in your company in order to file a bulk uh, complaints in that proceeding. So these are all the concerns. It's interesting. If you, if you already have a trade, it doesn't really matter what country you're in, Hong, if you already have a trademark, then you've pretty much gone through the process of getting a trademark. It's 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 more it's it, it's more meaningful if you're talking about protecting protecting brands that don't necessarily have an existing an existing trademark, which at the at the level of of small business in 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 Africa and and and, and parts of Asia is is a very valid is a very valid point. Do I have any other any other comments or any other questions at all from anyone, panelists, audience, people next door who can hear us? Mohammed, go ahead. Okay, um, I, I just want to raise uh, another additional point that maybe uh, will we'll join the point that uh, have the same concern than Chinese is uh, the reserve name. I mean, it means um, uh, at the African level, some of the um, institution have raised a big concern regarding well, a database of uh, of names that will not have not been fully qualified yet, but in fact that can harm some of the uh, geographical and uh, historical heritage on some of the African continent. That point has been uh, raised many times, and even this, the, 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 the former president of Senegal have raised that point during the former ICANN meeting, like uh, some of the domain names were really touching regarding the culture of different countries. And uh, we know that this process will be taken into account on the evaluation for ICANN. But, uh, can we, in order just to make uh, stronger confidence with the relationship we get with local institution, regional and national institution, what step have been achieved forward in order to integrate this type of stuff to not um, conflict with the uh, intellectual property, thing, the trademark stuff and the reserve name that comes from the uh, very sensitive um, area in the country concerned? Might have to, you might just have to give me a little bit more there. You're talking about a conflict between a trademark and something that's a sensitive cultural. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're talking about something that perhaps might be a clothing brand, for example. Yes, something that might that be a brand for some company that conflict with the name of, uh, of a, a very um, yeah, uh, historical region in a country. And on the table of ICANN, it will be just a TLD a GTLD uh, request, and on the other side, people have trying to yes. give more voice to regional organization to be more heard and to avoid this type of thing. It happened in the past, in, I yep. mean, at the registration of second level domain name, but people want to prevent it because we're trying to accommodate, to, to accommodate with different stakeholders. Akram, do you want to just briefly talk about that? Well, I think that the point system that uh, was developed in the application is to actually address these things. So uh, between a community and a, uh, and a regular brand, for example, a community will prevail. So you can score more points if you are a community than you are a brand, and therefore you will break the tie with that. So there are, pro uh, there are mechanisms within the application process to uh, deal with this issue. But there's more to it than that, Akram, isn't there? Because if you don't have, if it's not a competing application, but rather, um, a, a brand application that's that's objected to, uh, so you're not. It's not about point scoring within the application system. It's more about the efficacy of the objection process and ensuring that what I think Mohammed is asking is how do we ensure protection for uh, 
how do we, without wishing to be pejorative, how do we ensure uh, that a, a commercial organization doesn't grab ownership of something that is to many people a meaningful term uh, that describes a place that they might live, for example? Yeah, well, I think the objection process is a mechanism for that, including um, you know, the independent objector is somebody that uh, can uh, raise an objection on these issues. Um, and that's that's why we have the mechanism. And uh, unless if it's a, if the geographical name is on one of the l lists that uh, require additional backup in order for you to get the name, right? Do you want to say something else, Mohammed? Well, if you were in an ICANN meeting, I would be very satisfied <laughs> with the answer. <laughs> but we are not. So it's, okay. that's really why it comes. All right. uh, to elaborate a little bit on that because uh, it is IGF and uh, the we're talking about uh, how we um, take into consideration, into consideration something that is not a remark or, or, or just an idea in a process where people need to take some of their comments not only as suggestion but as um, higher priority demand that need to be treated in another way. So it's, uh, I'm not saying that these things have to be uh, taken as I'm stating it, but people are expecting to get a formal answer uh, from that area that has become really sensitive. And I think okay. that the GAC have already talked about it and raised the point, but in fact, we didn't have anything official coming back. Uh, I'll give you an example. Ashanti can be just given by somebody who just submitted an application. Do you think that Ghana country going to say that, well, uh, me, the president, I'm raising my hand saying that you cannot give Ashanti to somebody because Ashanti is, is just the hurt of my culture as a Ghanaian. So then it's I can to understand it. I mean, it's just the opposite. Who will be at the beginning of the, in each process, you have to say who's going to raise the point or is that something that we can find out a way to utter, I mean, utter, I don't know. I mean, it's just I'm not saying that we already have sorted out, but in fact, the way we explored the exploding the, the domain name, uh, the GTLD space, we need really to take into account this type of conflict that really are uh, not only technical conflict because we are more focused about what's going to harm the it. technical space uh, rather than just what's going to be a harmful staff at an okay. organization level when you interact between government countries and uh, okay. uh, the international organization that is ICANN, and it's really responsible. I think, I, I take your point, I think, I mean, Akram's, I think we've, the, 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 the short answer to your question right now, and otherwise we'll be here all night, is, is and I thought we were going to finish early, clearly not, um, is the independent objector, because it's, it's the independent objector's job to make those kind of moral decisions. Akram, I'm going to hear from you, then I'm going to Joy. Tom, and, to and to add to that, I think that any community could go to its government and go through the GAC for objections as well. So there are multiple objection mechanisms to uh, affect uh, uh, this kind of uh, application. Okay. Did, Hong, you want to talk about this specifically? Uh, are you on the same point? Or? Oh, yes, yeah, so it's a very specific uh, response to uh, uh, Mohammed's point. I, I guess this is a very valid question. Uh, there's a conflict between the uh, new GTLD screen and the geographical names. Uh, but this, um, um, Akram is right. It could be put in the morality and public order if it's a simple geographical name. But think about under the WTO TRIPS agreement, there's a ge geographical indications. If in that case, it's a kind of legal rise. It's in, it can actually be categorized in another dispute resolution process. In that case, probably the, well, who is representing that GI uh, group? Um, well, yeah, he can file another objection. There's, so it's not limited to independent objector or, or, no. or, or, or this. Oh, you disagree, to, okay. No, no, I don't disagree. I agree with you. It's not limited to, I was simply saying that if, if the people are uncomfortable filing an objection, then that's part of what the independent objector is, is about. Joy. Thanks. Um, my point's actually on a, on a different um, topic, although perhaps related. Um, and it was really sort of going to the, I guess, what the topic of the workshop was, which was looking at sort of multi-stakeholder processes in the light of our, our lived experience in the new GTLD process. And um, I, as, as, a, as a relatively new GNSO counsellor and, and being from APC and the non-commercial user constituency, I, I just wanted to reflect that I've, I've felt 
that although um, in, the, in the heat and uh, the depths of some of this new GTLD process, um, there have been some dark moments. Um, I think that actually overall we've really, we've really witnessed a sort of a, um, a growth really and a depth in the multi-stakeholder process through the new GTLD um, experience, for, for want of a better word. I mean, I look at the, at the number of ICANN board members who are around this table, um, which I acknowledge, um, and the GAC members and, um, uh, and others from the internet community. And I think that here at the IGF, having a conversation in quite a different way um, than perhaps might have happened um, some years ago. And I think that um, I think it's a, that's a good thing to acknowledge and, and remember. Um, I think that uh, from a human rights perspective, to have a new applicant guidebook that references human rights, uh, albeit in probably one of the thickest application books I've, I've seen, um, and I've seen a lot as a lawyer. Um, uh, you know, I think that it's important to, to acknowledge that actually there have been some significant steps forward in this arm wrestle for multi-stakeholder um, models of, of developing internet public policy um, through the new GDLD process. Um, and that's not to say that I endorse uh, all of the, the outcomes of that process. I think there were recommendations made in relation to the, the applicant guidebook um, that weren't taken up. Uh, I think there were issues with, um, you know, the, the assistance for those from developing countries, and I think there are opportunities in the next year, particularly in the ICANN meeting in Durban, to, to reach out and pick up on those. Um, uh, but I do think, I, I do wonder, I suppose my question is, if we look at where we are now and we think ahead, for what, and we know what's coming, you know, what are the things that we could be doing to try and strengthen and support that multi-stakeholder process as it continues to grow in ICANN? Um, uh, so that it's not just simply an amplification of new voices or existing voices that, that get louder, um, but rather sort of more nuance, um, I hesitate to say more harmony, um, and more diversification in those multi-stakeholder um, voices, particularly civil society and those from developing economies. I'd really, I'd really value a sort of a forward look and some reflections on that from, from people around the table. I'm happy to take that point and see if there's anyone who'd like to comment on it before we, we come to a close. Akram? One second, Akram. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so uh, I, we agree we have uh, made a step forward with the new GTLD program. It opened up the membership of uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, to a new uh, well, we, we're under a lot more attention, and therefore there are more par uh, a lot more participants coming from our uh, normal uh, participation, but also we're seeing participation from uh, uh, stakeholders that weren't on the table for the longest time, uh, and that poses uh, both a, an opportunity and a challenge, and I think that everybody's aware of that. I think that the uh, uh, community is looking at how to embrace the newcomers and how to you know, put, make a seat on the, uh, on the table for them. Uh, and also, I think that uh, we're looking at the uh, uh, ways that we are structured to make it more, uh, more welcoming and uh, less uh, and reduce the barrier of participation in, in ICANN, both with the tools that we're providing, but also uh, we are looking at ways to uh, uh, welcome not only the IP lawyers that have been uh, the uh, the front, have been taking the front seat on the new GTLD program, but also who sits behind them, which means it's the brand owners that are now looking at this and saying, oh, this is an opportunity for innovation. I mean, so far in, during the whole new GTLD program, we've been hearing from only the IP attorneys that have been doing protection. Now we're starting to see the marketing folks and the business development folks from these brands coming to the, the ICANN meetings and looking for ways to be heard and participate. And this, uh, this is something that we're looking at, uh, how we're going to be able to make a seat for them on the table. And, uh, but it, we, we are changing, and uh, we have to continue to improve and evolve as uh, uh, our participants change and grow. And uh, I think this is a... Uh, uh, challenge, but also a very good opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you, Akram. Sir. Hello, now Matsukanta. Um, I'd like to speak as a uh, former international trade negotiator uh, who is a relative newcomer to the multi-stakeholder process. Um, and there have been a lot of comments today that have, have touched on the issue of, of uh, rule of law. Um, 
whether it be geographical indicators or the negotiations going on in the TPP. And there was also discussion about government understanding ICANN better, ICANN understanding government better. And the question, I, I, I guess I'm seeking to be better educated about this, but as the process moves forward, there seems to be much more of an interest in the rule of law and a certain set of expectations <clears throat> that are being brought to ICANN from people who have been participating in a system of rule of law. And I would say the comment that was just made about marketeers and, and corporations that are getting involved in the ICANN process. And I was just wondering, um, at least from my observation, I, that the multi-stakeholder process prioritizes participation over accountability. The rule of law system tends to prioritize accountability. Uh, governments tend to work in a system that's based on the rule of law where there's accountability. Governments develop positions on public policy issues that require consensus at home before they forward those positions uh, in international fora. And I was just wondering, as these two worlds begin to merge uh, with the new GTLD program, how ICANN will respond uh, to expectations of new participants who have an interest in greater accountability through the rule of law? I don't, uh, I'm not sure that I, uh, I think those two things are mutually exclusive and I actually think that the current multi-stakeholder model that we, that we operate under does allow for, 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 for both and in fact that the model itself is, is becoming embraced to a great extent by, by governments uh, who over the term of this new GTLD process have become more and more involved and more prepared to operate under the um, uh, under the, the multi-stakeholder model so that rather than butting heads with us and saying you must do it our way, they've actually come and said, well, how do we do it your way? And began to understand that it is a multi-stakeholder model and in fact, um, I think, Maria referred to it earlier, as Fatty had said, as an equal, multi-stakeholder equal model. Um, and so therefore they can get what they want, provided that they don't always insist on getting everything that they want. So, and, and, and they are accountable. But maybe I've misunderstood your, your point. Actually, I'm not suggesting that one formula has to take primacy over the other. Um, I think we're in a system where they're beginning to interact with each other and was just wondering how that interaction was going to play out because you're suggesting in your comment here that governments are bending over and accepting the multi-stakeholder process. And I would suggest that it's, it's hard for governments to accept a multi-stakeholder process because they come to organizations like ICANN with a, a mandate that's been developed politically through accountability uh, processes like elections. And it's hard to understand how they can accept a different system and take that home and sell that to their constituency. So I, I, I'm not seeking that there's a primacy that has to happen over one version over the other, but really how that interaction will play out. And to the comment that was made earlier about looking forward and seeing how this will play out, I was just wondering if that is a consideration that ICANN is making. That's an, it's an interesting distinction. I think, uh, I think that, that what's happening right now in respect to the way that this is being put together is, is through the multi-stakeholder model and there is an acceptance from governments about putting, you putting it together for, for using this model, but make absolutely no mistake about it. When it comes to the new GTLDs going out into the big wide world and doing what they say they are going to do, that is when the rule of law is going to apply and anybody who imagines that we're going to be sitting around at an ICANN meeting debating whether or not a particular GTLD manager has, a, has broken the terms of his contract or not, um, that's not going to happen. That's when, that's when, the, that's when the, rule of, the rule of law will, uh, will, st will step in. Um, I, I, this, it, it, it's a shame. We could have had this discussion for, we could have this discussion for a long time. Any final, final comments before we close it up? Mohammed, I'll give you one more. One more comment regarding the enhanced cooperation with the two main actors in the African continent. We have that discussion a couple of times ago, but in fact, uh, it has the same goal. The goal is uh, whether we are talking to regulators uh, who need more knowledge regarding the process and who are the interface in terms of discussion uh, regarding the introduction of technology, how they're going to enable the market to happen, 
whether it's going to be with the ICANN and constituency, like the CCTLDs in the country or the registrar or whatever we, uh, we're talking to, enhancing collaboration and cooperation with these different organizations is, for me, something that we could not avoid if we want to better serve the uh, end user, the registrant community. Because, in fact, without this enhanced cooperation, people will not really understand at the level where people need it and where really all the actors have to be coordinated in order to deliver properly the service, these things will never happen. This is a broad area where we did not achieve much and really this is where we are waiting for ICANN to have a great expansion in terms of cooperation. Well, I don't think we could have, I don't think we could have closed on a better, closed on a better comment of tying uh, the multi-stakeholder model and enhanced cooperation together, so thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in thanking the panel for the, their comments today. For those of you who are ICANN people, there is another ICANN workshop tomorrow, ICANN forum uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, tell all your friends.